Hello. Uh, first of all, uh, if you're here for the enhanced uh, real-time workflows talk, you're in the right place. Um, I just thought that sounded more interesting. Uh, so uh, yeah, we will be covering uh, the Lazy Artist Guide to Real-Time VFX, uh, but we'll also be looking at a bunch of other stuff as well. Uh, so to that point, hi, I'm Mike, and I'm a Lazy Artist. Uh, and what I want to show you today is how to be a Lazy Artist too. Because let's be honest, you don't really want to do any work. You want to avoid work, get someone else to do it, do as little as possible. Uh, and I think that's a, that's, a, that's a goal worth striving for. Uh, so just quickly, uh, in the room, uh, how many VFX artists do we have? Ah, that's not too bad. Tech artists? Uh, environment artists? I apologize now for what I'm going to say later. Uh, any level designers? OK, even better. Great. We can carry on with those in-jokes. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, what I want to show you is basically, um, you know, how can we do things like distribute work? Uh, if you're working in production, you probably know uh, that you've got a finite amount of time uh, to get a bunch of stuff done. And the best way to solve that is don't do the work yourself. Give it to someone else if you can. So um, hopefully, I'm going to show you some ideas today of how you can do that, how you can distribute some of the things you would normally do to some of the other um, team members, because they're not really doing much anyway. They have a lot of free time, so let them worry about this. Um, and as you know, as production is kind of growing, you're probably working with external partners. So how do you leverage their capabilities to, to help you uh, get done what you need to? And then I think the other part of this, something that we're always looking for, is reducing the, the friction to, to doing what you're doing. There are just certain aspects of your work that take a really long time, um, and it pulls you out of your flow because you're having to wait for processing or something else. Um, so, so what do we do to, to reduce the amount of back and forth between packages? Uh, what do we do to reduce the amount of time spent uh, waiting for stuff? And, and hopefully you'll come out with some ideas uh, for that today. So let's jump straight into it. Um, the first thing that I want to show you today uh, actually came out of a couple of conversations around GDC earlier this year, um, and specifically for visual effects artists, because uh, what we, we realize is that you're probably making a lot of simple meshes that you're using with your particle editors. And they're, they're not overly complex, but you've got to go to your DCC package, model them, figure them out, and then take them back into your particle editor, and then realize that you might need to tweak, and back and forth you go. So we thought, well, how can we uh, reduce that, that, that kind of back and forth? Um, and so what we developed is basically these simple mesh generators, um, and they run through Houdini Engine, uh, and we came up with a couple. So the first one that I looked at was essentially just a disk. Um, and then what I've done is I've exposed a bunch of controls that allows me to control uh, the shape of that disk. Um, it also allows me to uh, give it a profile if I want to, so I've got some, some curve options to, to change that up. Uh, and so now what I'm able to do is, is create those same things directly in the game engine as opposed to having to jump back to, to one of your other packages and get it done. Um, as well as that, UVs. Sometimes you, you just want to kind of very quickly change how your UV is going to look. So we've exposed controls for that so that what happens is if you want something to kind of speed up or slow down through the UV space uh, as the, the texture is panning, uh, then, then just use those controls instead. Um, and then you know, we thought, well, what are the other types of simple meshes that you might want to use? Uh, something else that came up quite often uh, was the idea of just a cylinder, whether it's for a weapon effect or, or something else along those lines. Um, this is the same video. Uh, let's try that one. Uh, and so, uh, once again, it, you know, you don't always know kind of how you want to shape this or what the profile is going to look like. So, what this allows you to do is actually grab a curve and move around the beginning and the end points uh, to set that up, and then start playing with some of those those basic shape details. Um, the other thing we realized that would be handy is dealing with vertex color. Sometimes you want to just very quickly step onto vertex color to either drive the shader, or you want to use it uh, to to mask certain areas out, uh, and so we've, we've exposed those kind of controls. Um, and you've got full control over the, the color separate from the alpha, um, and then you can, you can use that with your, your, your shaders. Uh, 
And then we thought, well, you know, it's a cylinder, but maybe we can take that a little bit further because someone always needs to make a tornado. So let's add in some twist to that as well. Um, and that allows you to kind of get a little bit more in there. But to do that, you would also need to increase the resolution of the mesh. Uh, so you can basically choose uh, your, your U and V uh, divisions, essentially. Uh, and we're kind of getting closer to what we want, but in order for this to work, uh, we also want to add some noise to that. So there's some procedural noise that uh, will, will modify the mesh, um, and in very little time, you can kind of get to these interesting shapes um, and, and, and kind of do that iterative work uh, without leaving your game engine necessarily. Uh, and this is a, a really simple one, but funnily enough, there was quite a few people asking for it, which was a sphere. Uh, that seems to be uh, pretty big. But more importantly was the UVs on the sphere. You're always dealing with having to deal with the pinching at the top and at the bottom. Uh, and so this is essentially a cube um, laid out UV setup, but for a sphere. So you don't get the pinching at the top and the bottom. There's still some seam issues, uh, but the idea is that you can kind of use that as a starting point uh, and then cut and define that, that sphere as you want. Uh, so nothing really groundbreaking here, but think about the time that it would take you uh, to kind of set this up and go back and forth between your DCC and your game engine. And now you can just do it directly in there. Uh, and this actually fits into a, uh, a bigger uh, exercise that we're doing at SideFX, which is to kind of unify certain aspects of Houdini Engine. Um, so this is just some of the things that I created just from those, those three tools. And this probably took me about five or ten minutes to just kind of knock out a bunch of different shapes. Um, and the things that we're covering are the, the basic mesh shape, uh, it's vertex color and being able to add that and modify it. Uh, it's modifying your UVs and then having things like noise, uh, which you can add to any one of these, as well as profile curves to kind of get some more interesting shapes. And because it's running through Houdini Engine, you can take those same tools and you can run them in Unity, you can run them in Maya. Uh, we will soon have uh, access to a Max plugin as well. Um, so if any of your other teams are using those tools and you just don't really want to do this work, you can just give it to them. Uh, you can worry about building the tool around that uh, and letting them kind of deal with the, the nitty gritty. How many people uh, have seen the, the Nigra um, demo that Epic showed earlier this year? Okay, a couple of you. So I'll, I'll give a brief overview um, and then kind of show some of the new stuff as well. Uh, so uh, I guess to that point, how many of you are using UE4? Okay, probably the same hands. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Uh, so the idea here is um, that if you're doing destruction uh, or any kind of work in Houdini, th there's, there's already easy ways to get that data into your game engine, whether it's FBX or vertex animation textures. But there was all this other stuff that kind of got left by the water's edge. It was, you know, where did those pieces hit the ground and how does that drive particle systems? Uh, and we wanted to find a way to bring that across as well. So you can see here that what we're showing is those impact points uh, of where those pieces hit, as well as some data about how strong was that impact, the direction that it was going in. Uh, and we want to bring this across to the engine. So with the help of uh, Niagara, uh, as well as uh, the Houdini plugin that goes with that, you can now actually export that data and bring it into uh, UE4. And so now you have access to all of this kind of initial data that you can drive your particle systems with. And so by using those attributes, the direction, the intensity, the speed, whatever else you want, uh, you can hook up particle systems to that. Uh, and so you get something like this. So there was an initial amount of work that went into setting up some, some systems, some particle systems, but I think there were maybe two or three. There was one for the smoke, there was another one for the debris, uh, and then there might have been a third one. Uh, and all I'm doing is I'm saying when a certain action happens, so if the impact is big enough, spawn a certain type of particle system. Uh, depending on the size of the chunk, depending on how quickly it's moving, uh, it's using that to drive all of this. 
And I think the reason that's cool is because, as you know, there are always changes. Uh, either the animation team has decided to update uh, their portion of the level, or the entire level is reworked, um, or art directors, being art directors, want to change things. I never understood that. Um, but, you know, this is part of production. This is what you're going to have to be dealing with. Um, so. Let me know if this sounds familiar. You've set up this big destruction piece, you've set up all the particle systems, and then they say, no, 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 we don't want it to go this way, we want it to go that way. And you have to manually go and place and replace and time all of that stuff out. Um, but with this uh, workflow, essentially what I did was I updated the, the destruction uh, and I changed which chunk of the, the statue would fall out, exported that along with the, the initial data, and I did not touch anything on the, the Unreal side. Everything you're seeing here in terms of the particle spawning and the debris, because I already set up those parameters, it just came along for free. Um, and so now you've cut out all of that time that you would have spent doing that replacing, uh, and you can iterate a lot quicker as you're moving through this process. So that's kind of the stuff that was covered at uh, GDC. Uh, it was the initial pass of what we're trying to do with integrating Houdini better and getting that data across into your game engines. Uh, but we also realized that it's not just about initial data. What if there's animated data that you want to bring across in some way? Uh, take, for example, uh, something like a, a barrel explodes and you have a chunk flying through there and you want to attach a particle system to that. Uh, you need to track the position of that object through space. And you can do that with um, skeletal meshes, um, but they can get quite expensive if you have too many chunks, um, and there's a couple of other limitations. So what we've introduced is a way to interpolate data. And I wanted to show something that wasn't effect specific, but more shows how the system can work. So what I have here is literally just me taking a font sop, which allows me to, to write out a word, and then using the, the curve of the, um, the, the letter, uh, I want to essentially have a particle follow along that curve. So I'm using the, the points of each letter as kind of a, a waypoint, and then I'm gonna follow that as, uh, as we move along it. So I export that as uh, a CSV file, essentially, and then I can bring that into Unreal. Uh, and then I can basically have a particle follow along, interpolating along that curve, and then uh, using, um, I'm gonna go blank on the word now, um, ribbons as well as an event system, I can then have a ribbon follow that along. So as far as I know, this hasn't been something that's been possible in the past. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunities to do this. Uh, remember that this is all happening essentially in the, the particle system. It can happen on the GPU. You're not taking up CPU cycles in order to do this kind of stuff. And um, Wyeth Johnson at Epic's actually been playing with some of the, the, the Nigro Houdini functionality recently, uh, just trying to see what other interesting things he can do with this data that we're able to send across. And so what he did was he created this very simple shape and then he exported uh, information about each one of those faces. So essentially their orientation and their ID. And then using that in Niagara, he's able to hook that up and have a real-time uh, simulation of these, these pieces moving. So he's using the, the, the kind of the strength of dealing with uh, quaternions and, and the data that Houdini can provide and, and initializing that. And then with the Houdini Niagara plugin, bringing that in and setting up something like this. Um, super simple, but I think it shows kind of the, the, the breadth of what is possible uh, with this tool. Now, uh, I, I'm focusing on the, the VFX stuff for a little bit longer. Um, uh, how many people here are, have done or are doing rigid body dynamic stuff? Okay, a couple. Um, a sheepish hand at the front there. Uh, so that's actually good to see. So um, I, I think we're, we're noticing more and more that uh, this is something that is expected of a real-time VFX artist. Uh, it, it actually hasn't been, I think, to a large extent um, in the past, and it's now becoming more popular. Uh, but if you have done this kind of work, you know that it can be really uh, time uh, intensive. Uh, the workflows are not great, and so we wanted to improve that. We wanted to see if we could make it easier to do 
80% of the stuff you do because sure there are going to be hero shots that need the crafting but sometimes you just need to pump out a lot of assets that's kind of part of the process and um, and so that's kind of what we're looking at here so starting with the basics uh, the first thing we wanted to do was look at fracturing uh, and this essentially is a wrapper around stuff that you've probably done a hundred times uh, we do some Voronoi fracturing uh, but then something that we've added here that I haven't seen in the past is how we deal with clustering because clustering in itself uh, can be quite slow uh, and the reason is because it's generally done at the same time as the fracturing and so what we've done is we've, we've done it after the fact and now you can actually update your, your cluster attributes and, your, and how it works and get almost uh, real-time uh, interaction. Uh, so that was uh, one part of it. Um, I've now missed a whole bunch of other stuff along the way. Uh, but the other thing that we added to that was also just simple controls to choose where do you want more uh, fracture pieces. Uh, and to do that, we're just using basic geometry to, to control those volumes, uh, as well as being able to kind of plug in a piece of geometry that says, give me uh, this entire thing as a cluster or don't do any clustering here whatsoever. Uh, so I, I think this is the kind of stuff that will cover a lot of the, 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 the basic uh, rigid body work that you might be doing. So to kind of flesh that out, we realized we needed three things. We needed to deal with the fracturing, we needed to deal with the crafting of the, the RBD, and then we also need to deal with the simulation part at the end. And for the, the sim part, all I'm going to say is that we've basically just done a wrapper uh, around the, the dop nets. So you stay in SOPs because generally artists are a lot more comfortable in SOPs than they are in DOPs. And there's a lot of cool controls that we can use there, and it's a little bit easier to uh, follow the flow of that data. Uh, so now with those three nodes, you can basically fracture it up, set up your initial uh, kind of constraints, and then run it through the SIM. Um, and I think this is a little bit simpler than maybe other ways that you've seen it being done. So getting to the good stuff, uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this and this is still an early pass, uh, but I think the thing that takes up the most amount of time is crafting your simulation. It's actually choosing what do you want to, to blow up, when do you want it to break, when do you want it to explode, and how does it interact with other objects. And so what we have as a part of this is an RBD director. Uh, and the way that that works is it will give you some basic controls uh, for um, using volumes to define areas and when you want to activate those areas, and then also using those very same volumes to add forces if you want certain areas to blow up to do whatever you want it to do. Uh, so you can very quickly, crafting with those blue nodes, your entire sim, as well as if you have animated objects, uh, then you can convert that animated object to a dynamic object when you choose, uh, and add that to the system. And the way that we set this all up as well is that it all merges into one stream. So you're not trying to manage you know, 10 or 15 different areas, you're coming down to the single point of, of contact essentially. Uh, and, and so hopefully uh, it allows you to do a lot of this stuff uh, a lot quicker. Uh, this is a first pass. There are a lot of things we still want to do with this. Uh, we've focused primarily on clustering. Uh, we haven't gone into constraints yet. We are going to be getting to that uh, eventually. But the idea was that for a lot of the, the more simple destruction setups, uh, this is good enough. And that's kind of what we're trying to, to focus on. And something that I didn't include, which is a bit of a bonus, is we also have a retime node. So if you do want to take your sim uh, and just do a very quick retime to kind of get some interesting effects, uh, then, then we, we, we've simplified that so you have a curve that you can modify and it'll do what you need to do. Uh, I didn't mention this, but I probably should. Uh, this is all part of the game development tool set. So if you're not familiar with that, I will be talking a little bit more about that later. This is downloadable directly into Houdini. Uh, it's currently hosted on GitHub. Uh, but yeah, I'll get into that a little bit later. So the true lazy artist, like I said, doesn't do the work themselves. They give it to someone else. Uh, and so taking the same idea, uh, what if we give this to other teams? Uh, you know, a lot of the environment artists are often dealing with, with making the meshes. Uh, and if you're dealing with destructible assets, why don't they just deal with the destruction of them as well? 
Uh, so taking those same tools that you've just seen, you can actually run them in Maya, and so someone else can deal with the fracturing. They can deal with that initial setup, uh, setting this uh, up in a way that can then be used in your game engine. So it doesn't have to go through the effects artist to get into the engine, it can go from the environment artist directly to the game engine if you want. And we've, we've been working pretty hard in the Maya plugin lately uh, because we do realize that there are quite a few people uh, who are still going to be using that tool and, and so we want to support that the best way we can. Um, and so there's a couple of things that we've done I think with, that are worth mentioning that are coming out uh, in 17. Uh, the first one being is now when you use an asset, a Houdini asset in Maya, it actually is part of the history. So before it was considered kind of a separate thing that uh, you would plug something into and it would generate a new mesh. Whereas think of this the same way you would uh, using a bevel or a smooth or a deformer in Maya uh, to generate the final mesh. So this is what you would see in your channel box essentially. So we can use this for things like fracturing, so it stays as part of the initial asset. Uh, we can use this for things like generating ambient occlusion or if you want to use some of the modeling tools in Houdini in Maya, you can now do that. So poly reduction comes to mind as, as one example. Um, so I think this is, this is a pretty big win. I think this is going to save a lot of time. It's also going to make you, uh, give you the ability to create these tools and then use them in other places. The other thing that I want to mention is uh, we will be including a shelf, so there are some of these tools ready to go if you do want to try out the Maya plugin side. Um, and then something on a little bit more of the technical aspects of this um, is uh, generally up until now, the plugin has been running in process. Uh, and what that meant was uh, we were able to, to get some pretty good feedback uh, if you were using Houdini with Maya. Uh, but we were running into some conflicts. So we've moved it to out of socket, which basically means it's running a separate process. Uh, and we've worked really, really hard to make sure that you haven't lost any of those speed benefits. Um, and the reason I bring that all up is because it's great that we can send fracturing to a different team, but what if we can actually send the simulation to a different team who maybe isn't quite ready to start using Houdini? So that is the next step to this, uh, is that you would be able to fracture up your asset, drop down essentially an RBD sim node, which is coming from Houdini in Maya, and do your simulations there. So that gives you the control to build uh, these, these, these assets uh, and expose the stuff that you want and it's no longer a black box where some other plugins unfortunately they, they are good at certain things but you can't really get into the guts of them and, and make any modifications. Let's talk a little bit, little bit about fire for a second. Um, I spoke about this at GDC uh, but I, I think it's worth mentioning again. Um, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do is simplify a lot of these processes that can take time to set up. Uh, and Pyro is a classic example. Uh, if you've ever had to do any kind of volumetric simulation stuff, um, it's going to take you a couple of days or a week to, to get something that looks good. Uh, and if you're working within production and you've got a sprint to get stuff done, uh, it doesn't leave you a lot of time for crafting. So what we decided to come up with was some fire presets. Let's take the guts essentially of everything that you want to do and put it into uh, a single asset. And so you can get something like this. So the way that that works is you have uh, a simple HDA uh, which has exposed a bunch of controls uh, that we think are important to the sourcing, the simulation, as well as the rendering side of the fire. And then we have a drop-down preset menu. So you can choose the preset that you want, and we've basically dialed in these values to get you a lot closer to that production asset. So now, within a couple of minutes, uh, you're able to create something and render it out as opposed to a couple of days. And the reason I'm bringing this up again is because uh, at the time of doing this, it wasn't a couple of minutes, it was 10 to 15 minutes. And so we went back and we had a look at how we were doing things internally. Um, and thanks to the dev team, we fixed a bug with OpenCL. Uh, and we also found a different way to handle the sourcing and simulation. And so now it's about five times faster than what it was uh, about six months ago. So now you can do, uh, I would say, a production level simulation of 100 frames. Uh, and this is running on a laptop 
in about two or three minutes. So your, your ability to iterate and make those changes is now a lot quicker than if you were having to send this off to a farm or use your machine overnight to get the same kind of work done. And this is just showing those different presets. So we have a one meter wide high, uh, low, uh, fire a torch flame, and then also um, a candle on steroids. It's a little big. Um, I didn't ask, is anyone in, uh, in the room, in the film industry, kind of just interested in the real time side? Okay, couple, couple of hands, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not going to take a dig at, uh, at a company for, for saying that this was a brand new thing. But um, yeah, so imposters. Um, some of you may or might not know about these, but essentially the idea is how do you represent something uh, on a sprite in a way that it looks 3D? Um, and that's where imposters come in. Uh, Epic have had this for a while. A couple of other companies have also introduced their own implementation, and we thought we should have one as well because what we have, which is really great, is the volumetric tools, and now we want to provide the, that with the ability to create these imposters. So if you want to create something that looks like a volume that has a, sort of a 3D feel to it, uh, that's what this will do for you. And essentially what it's doing is it's rendering out uh, that object from a lot of different angles, uh, either from a fixed axis or from, from a 360 uh, kind of view. Uh, and then using the angle to the camera, we pick one of those uh, in order to display it to the viewer. Uh, and this is pretty good for, for background stuff, more distant stuff, if it's kind of the last lot in your system. Uh, and it's also really good for, for cheap crowds, where maybe you don't want to pay for uh, the, the AI and everything else that goes along with, with a character, uh, but you want something that you can use with, say, a particle system. So this was an example where I basically rendered out uh, an animation of a character, uh, and that's kind of the, the, the image you saw just now, and it's looping through that animation and then picking up on the, the camera direction uh, and then displaying that uh, to us. So this is literally just a particle system that is running. Um, and like I say, it's great for kind of that, that background stuff that you don't want to get too close to, um, but it's going to let you kind of fill that space if that's what you're trying to do. And we've, uh, we've added octahedral imposters to this as well. Uh, if you're not too sure what those are, um, Ryan Brux at Epic uh, kind of released a paper uh, a couple of months ago now. And the idea is that uh, it's just more efficient in how it uses that texture space. So we're able to represent a 3D object on a sprite uh, and by using kind of some trickery with motion vectors as well as the, the, the kind of the rendering of that object, uh, you get something which looks pretty close to the real thing. Um, and it's a lot cheaper because you're just dealing with basically a quad. And I think I should point out, you know, you, some of you might be asking, well, why are you doing this? Other people are doing the same thing. We can already do that in, in other packages. Um, I personally have found some of the other uh, setups to be quite cumbersome. Um, and what we're trying to do is make this as simple as possible to get that asset out. If you're already bringing the stuff into Houdini, uh, then you should be able to put down a single node, hit render, get back into your game engine, and carry on doing what you're doing. You shouldn't have to set up a lot of these other things to go along with it. Uh, and to do what we're doing, uh, we're actually using a lens shader uh, which renders the entire uh, texture in one go. So it's actually not doing a sequence of images and then compositing those together. Uh, we've, we've built a lens shader that can basically trace per pixel whatever direction it needs to. I don't know if I killed that, no I didn't. Uh, and, and so what we're able to do with this is get near real-time feedback. So it's great to kind of get a sense of is this going to be something that's going to be useful to you or not. So that ends the, the, the VFX portion of, of the evening. Um, but I also want to show some of the other things that we've been looking at uh, to do with, with game development in general. And this is kind of ties in with this idea of in, enhanced uh, real-time workflows. Um, Photogrammetry, I think, is, is slowly seeping into uh, our jobs more and more. Um, and 
uh, one of the problems with photogrammetry right now is, if you've ever had to do it, uh, is it's kind of like a zigzag process. You've got to go from this package to this package, this package, back to that one, over here. Um, and there are a lot of offerings at the moment uh, that cover uh, different aspects of that pipeline, whether it's dealing with the high-res source, uh, all the game res geometry, laying out the UVs, baking out the maps, and then also exporting that. I can go back for a second if you want to take a photo. Are you good? Okay. Uh, so what we want to do here is how do we simplify that? How do we uh, create a backbone and potentially replace all of that jumping back and forth with a single unified experience? And we would like Houdini to be a part of that. So we have partnered with uh, Reality Capture for this. Um, and what we have right now, uh, and I think as of this week, we, we've actually just come out of beta, and I do have a couple of uh, trial licenses if anyone is interested, uh, is we're essentially taking what's good about Houdini and good about Reality Capture and doing it in one workflow. So uh, we bring in the mesh, uh, we then, uh, sorry, we, we use images and Reality Capture's ability to import all of those. Uh, we align all the images, uh, and then we use some Houdini tools to basically clean up and deal with some of the, 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 the cruft. Um, and you can kind of see the detail that we get from that. Uh, we can then clip out the, the stuff that we don't need uh, along the bottom. That's going to leave a couple of rough edges uh, and a couple of small pieces. So we have a, a little utility node that will delete those as well. Um, and then we still got a bit of a hole at the bottom with the feet, so we just fill that up. Um, and now we have something that we can either send to ZBrush uh, using our uh, Gozi um, uh, export. Um, so if you want to do any more cleanup there or do any, any modeling, uh, and this is a live connection, so you can bring it straight back into Houdini, carry on doing what you're doing and move on from there. Or uh, using our game dev, uh, gamer is, uh, sorry, uh, exporter, uh, generate all of your, your maps, your base color, your normals, uh, your displacement, that kind of thing, um, as well as your low res game ready version of that mesh. So now we've taken something that otherwise would require multiple software packages and we've kind of brought it down into a single one. Um, and here you can see some of the, the auto UV stuff that we're also able to take care of as part of that process. So these are some of the nodes that we have right now. Uh, you know, you can register images, align, uh, create the model, extract the cameras, uh, and then also load the textured model from that. Um, and we're constantly working with uh, with Reality Capture to, to to kind of make this uh, more fully featured if possible. Uh, we've been doing some testing internally, and so the, the assets you see down here were actually generated by an intern in LA. Uh, he was given essentially a huge library of images and told, go and play, um, and this is what he was able to, to come up with uh, using that, that workflow that we've shown. So we know that it, it's, it's robust uh, and that it can do what we say it does. Um, it works with current uh, RC licenses. Um, it doesn't work with command line for now because of the licensing uh, issues around uh, how that works, but they are currently working on a new licensing model. So we're hoping to, to see some more stuff coming from them soon. Um, and to that point, uh, the thing that we were working on at GDC was also the LiDAR capabilities. So you can now also bring in LiDAR data, uh, use it with Reality Capture and our, our workflow and generate your environments um, within Houdini. Something else uh, that I wanted to point out uh, is delighting. Uh, I think this is quite important because it's all good and well capturing that, that object, but if your base color doesn't look right or if it includes all this lighting information, uh, that's a whole nother step that um, some of you might, might have had to deal with before. It involves going into Photoshop or other packages and trying to essentially remove that. And so now we also have uh, part of that workflow node that can handle it. And to give you an idea of, of, of how it works, um, this is a pretty um, kind of complex example. Um, there's a lot of uh, shadowing and AO going on there. There's also some very subtle lighting shifts happening that you can't quite see here. Uh, but using the delighting tool, we're able to get to something which is much closer to the base color, and you can now use this with the asset in your real-time engine. And just to compare the two, uh, 
on the left and on the right, obviously, is the the, the delet version. Uh, there's a very subtle uh, blue kind of environment light from the from the the world kind of hitting this object, and then there's a little bit of yellow sunlight on the left as well. And that's all been removed. We've extracted or pulled up the the, the um, occluded areas as well, and you get something which is which is a lot better looking for your base color. So this is pretty new. Uh, I think we released it maybe last week, um, but uh, we've realized that sometimes what you want to do is see your asset in Houdini without having to go into your game engine. You want to kind of avoid as much as possible uh, that, that step of exporting the textures, exporting the asset, uh, but you still want to get a sense of what it's going to look like in a real-time environment. And so we've actually worked on a Marmoset viewer. So if you have a Marmoset tool bag license, uh, basically what we've done here is we've hijacked the help browser uh, and you're able to export uh, the Marmoset file type um, and then view that directly in here. So now you're able to, to get a better sense of what that asset will look like. You can change up your environment uh, and your, your lighting, uh, but it also means that you can essentially do rendering with this. So if you want to do high-res renders, uh, stills, uh, then you can do that and, and it'll be almost instantaneous. Uh, but what we're also finding is that some teams want to basically use this to export the, the Marmoset file so that they can do quick turntables. They can send it to their art director uh, who just has a simple viewer and they can very quickly go through and kind of tumble around and see what these assets are going to look like. Um, and, and I think this is going to save a lot of time, make life a lot easier uh, for a lot of people. And then the other thing that we found that was uh, was pretty useful is we've been working with Quixel quite closely. Um, if uh, if you have a look at our, our GDC presentations, we, we did a game demo called Brimstone. Uh, a lot of the, the texturing and the assets uh, in that were, were using Quixel's uh, mega scans. Um, and we actually had one of their artists help us out as well. Uh, and they have something called the Quixel Bridge, which basically allows you to go to their website, pick a bunch of assets, uh, hit download, and it'll uh, import them directly into your game engine. And we thought, well, we want that too. So uh, we actually started working on our own uh, where you could go to the website, log in, uh, choose the different assets you want, uh, and then hit import, and it'll do all of that setup for you. So it brings in the assets, sets up the shaders, applies the textures, uh, and so it allows you to very quickly kind of use this and view it. And then using it with the Marmoset Toolbag Viewer, uh, we're able to kind of get a sense of what that asset is going to look like. So we've, we've tried to simplify that pipeline as, as much as possible. Uh, Quixel came back to us and said, that's awesome. We'll take that from you. Thank you very much. Uh, and they're actually now developing this bridge themselves. So they're, they're going to be handling that going forward. Uh, but hopefully it means that uh, there's a much better integration across the, these kind of three areas. Uh, Mapbox. Uh, we have had the ability to import uh, OpenStreetMap data for a while now, uh, but the next step was Mapbox data. So if you're not familiar with this, uh, essentially uh, Mapbox data includes OpenStreetMap uh, information, uh, height field information, as well as satellite imagery. And when you take those three things together, you can recreate uh, a portion of the world in, an, in a 3D environment. So what we now have as part of this tool essentially is you uh, click on a button, it'll open up this viewer. You can navigate to a specific location in the world, kind of frame that up, uh, hit download, it'll like, bring all that data down and set it up in Houdini. So it'll use height fields the way it needs to. It'll set up the shader, uh, attach the textures. And if there is any OSM data with that as well, uh, that gets laid on, out on top. So if you are doing any city building, city generation stuff, and you want to use this data to drive that, it's all there ready to go. Um, and if you're not familiar with OpenStreetMap data, it has information about uh, the, the zoning of an area, how big the buildings are. There's, there's a lot of great stuff there that you can then use to procedurally drive generating cities and, and models. Uh, and yeah, here's an, uh, another example of kind of doing that where we've taken the height fields, uh, the textures, and then the, the street map data as well. Whew, okay, that was a lot of stuff. Um, 
so I, I mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, or, or halfway through, that um, uh, everything you've seen today is essentially part of the, the game dev tools. Uh, the games team, myself and Louise and, and Paul A, uh, are constantly working on new tools and refining the existing tools. Um, and you can basically open up Houdini, go to the game dev shelf, uh, hit a button that says update, install, and it will automatically download and, and set these tools up for you. Uh, we're trying to make that as easy and and um, kind of useful to you as possible. So part of that is we now have daily builds. So if you want to get the latest and greatest, you can click a button, choose the build that you want, and it will install that for you. Uh, as part of that, that installer window is now a lot simpler than it was before. And what we've realized is that um, it's not just us that wants to do something like this. Let's say that you have a GitHub repo uh, of a bunch of Houdini tools and you want to start sharing this with a community. Uh, what we're looking at is how do we generalize essentially the framework that we've created for the game dev tools. And we're, we're working towards providing this to, to others so that you can also have your own library uh, either internally or shared with, with the, the community as a whole. Um, and you don't have to worry about this kind of setup stuff. You just focus on building the tools, getting them into, say, GitHub or something else, uh, and we'll worry about how that gets downloaded and installed. And then lastly, uh, this is pretty new, and I totally made a mis uh, mis uh, mistake there in the spelling, uh, is analytics. Um, we're a small team. We're, we're essentially three people building these tools. Uh, we now have over 80 tools in the game dev tool set, um, and we're not slowing down. And we want to make sure that we're focusing on the right tools. So as part of the standard Houdini uh, uh, privacy agreement that you, you agree or not agree to at the beginning when you first open, uh, we're also now able to extract data about what sh which HDAs essentially you're using. Um, and you, you can turn that off. You don't have to, to be a part of that. But it helps us kind of figure that stuff out. Um, and to that point, and I think we've added this to maybe just a couple of the tools, is we have a little like button. So this is an experiment. It might work, it might not. But the idea is, you know, we want to hear from you in a, in a low friction way. So if you're using one of the game dev tools and you're finding it useful and you want to let us know, there should be a little button in the bottom right hand corner of the parameter window. Hit that, we'll get a note, and then we can kind of get a sense of who's using what and what's actually important. So we can focus our energies on that stuff rather than, uh, we've got a whole list of things we'd love to do and probably completely irrelevant to you, but they're fun for us, and, and we kind of need your help to stay focused. So that's the idea there. Uh, so yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'd love to hear from you. <clears throat> How does your performance compare to Reality Capture native? Uh, so it's 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 directly connecting to the Reality Capture API. So the question is, how how does the performance compare to using natively? Um, there 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 is no difference really. Um, it's 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 identical as far as I'm aware. So you're not getting any slowdowns by having to go through Houdini and then back out, uh, because what we're essentially providing is a wrapper. It's a it's a friendly UI that ties in with everything else, but the underlying computation is, is pretty much the same. And does that connect through the Houdini digital, or Houdini engine into something like Maya? Or is it, do you have to be inside of Houdini to use it? Uh, I think for now, it's in Houdini. Um, I, I gotta be honest, we haven't actually tried that yet, and it's the first time someone's asked about doing that. So I, we can chat more afterwards, and I can, I can see if I can get more information. Yeah, that'd be great. And then on the um, delighting, do you have an example of a face, perchance? Or do you only have the log example that you showed? Uh, is the question, do we have a, a face example? Yeah, of a head, a person's head. Yeah, so d I, th I think we're, we're good with, with hard surface slash semi-soft surface objects, uh, but I, I don't think we're there yet with characters. Um, we, we would love to be at some point, but um, extracting the lighting information and getting around kind of the surface properties of skin uh, is just not something that we're there yet with, so, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. 
So the question is, uh, are, are we looking at doing anything similar that we did for fire for ocean or fluids? Um, uh, we are. So ideally what we want to do, and I, I should have probably mentioned this, is just because uh, a lot of the stuff is, is authored in effects um, doesn't mean you can't use a core license. So everything that is wrapped up as an HDA, as an asset, can be used in core. And so what we're trying to do is provide these, these wrappers for these typical effects workflows, but allow you to use them in something like core. Uh, and so, yeah, we're, we're currently looking at kind of like a splat tool for fluids because it's the kind of uh, asset that you would generally want to create for, for um, you know, uh, bullet impacts and, and, and character impacts, that kind of thing. Um, we haven't looked at oceans, so that's actually a good one to, to think about. We, we haven't uh, gone down that route. But the idea is we will cover RBD, we'll cover fire, we'll look at fluids. Um, and then we're trying to see what we can do with particles. That's a bit more of a tricky one in terms of inputs and outputs. Thank you very much. Have a good cigarette.